Hello, today is April 7th, 2011. We're meeting today with Mr. Donald Merritt at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Don, and thanks for sitting down to, uh, to tell your story this evening. I thank you. Uh, you know, this is something unusual that I haven't done before. <laughs> well, good enough. Well, well, if we could, let's start out. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I'm the youngest of four kids. I was born in Hamlin, New York. It's right down on Lake Ontario. I don't know, maybe 8,000 people. Small town, really. And went to grade school in Hamlin. That was up to eighth grade. And then uh, high school, went to Brock Park, which is the next town up. And uh, after graduating, I uh, met my wife. Uh, we got married, uh, let's see, November 29th. And I got drafted as soon as I come back from New York. Well, give, give us a time frame. What year did you graduate? And give 19, us kind of a time. I graduated in 1950, and we got married in 1952. It, uh, so two years. That, uh, I was working at that time as a tool guy, um, going to apprenticeship really far. And then, of course, I got drafted and uh, finished up after I got back out of service. But, uh, well, primarily, it, uh, uh, in fact, it's a little unusual for the family. Four kids in the family, um, and each one of us manually built our own town, at, uh, which is not too often heard of, really, yeah. in, uh, nowadays, especially. At, uh, my mother always said, well, it was natural for you, because her maiden name was Naylor. And she had a cousin by the name of Tack, I think it was. So, so it was a standing joke in the family end of it. But, uh, but as of right now, the rest of all passed away, and I'm the only one left of the group now. I'll be done. Uh, so there was. Uh, so you had a two-year gap from the time you graduated from high school till you got drafted. Were you on notice that you would? Did you feel like you were going to get drafted, or how did that come about uh, at that time? It. Uh, for the first year, no. Um, and then after that, well, of course, you had to register. And I graduated, I was 17. Oh, okay. And when you turn 18, well, then you had to register at the town clerk. But um, then you knew, yeah, uh, eventually they were going to catch up with you. There was no doubt. That, uh, but, yeah, I uh, got the notice. In fact, before I sent, well, we had sent out wedding invitations. Of getting married and all of a sudden I got the notice in the mail so I took it down to the the bureau down there and told them and uh, they said just throw it away uh, you'll hear from us eventually afterwards and I said wonderful but um, yeah I think it was 10 days after I got married by <laughs> the notice was there I went in service oh, boy. To it. And then how long after you got your notice did you actually ship off then um, took 16 weeks to basic. I mean, I mean, soon, how soon after you got your notice did you leave for basic? Oh, um, less than a week. Is that right? Yeah. Did that give you yeah. enough time to put your affairs in order? And... Oh, well, luckily, just being newlyweds, why, um, we didn't have, we had an apartment all set, but, uh, we called them up and told them what happened, and they said, forget about it, and so, uh. Furniture and stuff like that, we didn't have at that point yet. So really, if you had to get drafted, that was a nice time to do it. Really. I guess so. Uh, and then which branch of the service did you get drafted into? The Army. The Army? Okay. Yeah, infantry. And then from there, where did you go off for your basic? Basic, I uh, first they sent us to Massachusetts, and we got oh, what they call flying 20s and taking tests and that. And then they took us down to Fort Dix. New Jersey, and that's where I'd had the basic training, and uh, after the basic, why well, I had, uh, I think it was four days delay in route, and then we got on a train and came across country by uh, last 
three cards. I think were all GIs, but it was connected right to a regular uh, regular train, and so we ate with all the civilians and everything else. Beautiful ride, really, cross country. Yeah. To, yeah. In fact, we stopped here in Denver. Up until that point, it was all diesel. Uh, but when we stopped in Denver, they put on the old steam engine locomotive, and that's what took us out through to Seattle, Washington. Is that right? That was oh god, just gorgeous, really. But, yeah. uh, how how was that transition for you, going from civilian life into military life? <laughs> different. <laughs> it when you get drafted like that, um, oh, some people hate it. Uh, it's a different experience, and you know something new is going to happen, and uh, so they keep you on edge. Really, you're wondering what's going to happen next. If it's sort of exciting, really. I yeah. To, yeah. I gotta say, I uh, I enjoyed it really. It, uh, oh, I didn't like leaving my wife and that the first thing. Oh, but, you bet. Uh, yeah. It's all part of the game. It, uh, so you guys went cross country to Seattle. Now, did you guys were you in a unit at that time, or were you still replacement, or um, what? Uh... Well, the whole unit went across country. Um, all the guys we took basic with. Uh, we're all right together all the way out through. And we went to Fort Lewis, Washington. We were there only two days. And then they put us on ship and shipped us over to Korea. And, and again, we were all, the whole group, all one at one shop. But, uh, we were all, uh, bunks were all right near each other. We uh, didn't have anything to do all the time you're there. It, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about that ship, that uh, sea crossing. How was it for you, particularly a boy from upstate New York? Did you get your sea legs, or uh, uh, how was the crossing for you? For me, it, uh, I didn't go out drinking. I wasn't a drinker at that time. And so the night before, most of the guys went out and really got plastered. And uh, thank heaven there were some of us that wasn't, because we were carrying two duffel bags to get them on the ship at the... Uh, they were in pretty bad shape. And then about the first day out, we got into real rough water. And needless to say, um, there was 3,500 GIs, I think it was. And about 3,000 of them were sicker than a dog. And, oh, God. <laughs> I made it through the first few days, okay. It's, to go to the mess hall, you had to go down three flights of stairs to get down into it. Yeah, and, uh, well, I got down there about halfway, and all of a sudden you could smell it coming up, and I, uh, that turned my stomach, and away I went back up. <laughs> it, uh, something that uh, lasts for about two days, and uh, then you get over it, and then from then on, it's nice. It's how, roughly how long did it take you guys to get from the States to uh, Korea? Let's see, I think it was close to 17 days. Is that think, right? Yeah. What did you do to kill the time? Uh, oh, I don't know. Just walk around the deck and stuff like that. You, we didn't have any duties or anything like that. It, um, it was all run by Merchant Marine, I believe. It, uh, <clears throat> one thing that did surprise me is you're, you go to the bus hall to eat, and it, it's not tables and chairs. It's a long tray all the way down. And it's only about so wide. It, uh, enough for two trays sit side by side. It, but you stood up to eat. It, uh, there was no stools or anything else. It, uh, that sort of surprised me. I, uh, consequently, no one stayed around down there too long. It, I mean, yeah, you yeah. ate and got out of there. But, uh, but uh, no, it, uh, one of the funny things, really, it, uh, if you had to go to the bathroom, it was a long trough and uh, all stainless steel and... Uh, but when you first went in, uh, there was always fluid and water in there. Oh, now with the ship going back and forth, you learn very fast. You always used the center because that way there the water was always level. But every now and then you get someone who's in a hurry and they get to the end and of course the water comes down. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, it was uh, <laughs> something, you, as long as it didn't happen to you, I, uh, it was funny, you know. But uh, but no, we got across. We wanted to stop at Sasebo, Japan, and uh, they told us we we're only going to be there one day. 
And they gave you all kinds of, um, well, they took the Class A uniforms, gave us the fatigues and that, and your rifle, and three shots to zero it in. And you had to go in and listen to about a three-hour deal about uh, the religion over there. And, and I thought that was good. It, uh, I think maybe it would be good if they did it nowadays, really. Mm. But, uh, but then at 8 o'clock in the morning, we got on the ship again, and it was just an eight-hour shot across, and uh, we ended up in uh, Pusan. And uh, then I got on train, and but out of 3,000 guys, there was only two of us that went to the 7th Division at, uh, for replacement. So uh, hmm. that's where we all got separated, really. It, uh, I forgot to ask you, when, when you went off, uh, when you got drafted, did anybody from your hometown go with you, or were you pretty much solo? Uh, no, there was one guy that uh, I went to school with. It uh, was with me. In fact, his name was Mott. And alphabetically, we were always within two or three of each other. And our serial numbers were right next to each other. So we figured we'd probably be together all the way, but it didn't work out that way. I, I don't know where he ever did end up, truthfully. Huh. But, uh, but, uh, now, where did you land in Korea? It was on the very south tip. It was Pusan. Pusan, okay. And we got on a train from there, and... Uh, that's nothing like what we came across country and it uh, wooden benches and that's it. Well, it must have been a culture shock from a, like I said, <laughs> probably a boy that grew up in upstate New York his whole life, really didn't travel too far away from home and, and now you're in a foreign country. Oh yeah, yeah. It, uh, and it took us all the way up through and dropped us off at uh, the company rear and uh, the first thing is, oh you saw the company commander at that point and uh, he wanted to know, he said, do you like your rifle? And I said, no. It, uh, I said, three shots, and I finally hit the target, but I, uh, and that was 26 clicks, and that's about the highest as the thing would go, really. And so he says, would you like, what would you like? And I said, a carbine if I can get it. So it's what I carried all the time I was over there, it, uh, which was nice. It, uh, a lot lighter. <laughs> now, as you were taking the train up, was there uh, <coughs> a lot of damage from the fighting as the, the front had moved up further? Or? Oh, yeah. It, uh, it, that, we were replacements is what we mm -hmm. were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you could see where the fighting had been going on all the way up through, really. You'd find old vehicles that are still dismantled out there and uh, had been hit. It roads, some of them were blown up, but... Uh, but when I got in the company, uh, for the first two or three days, uh, we slept in the daytime and went up with a peck and shovel uh, at nighttime. We worked all night uh, digging places for uh, upgrading trenches and stuff like that. And Where, where was the, the front line at this point? Had you... uh, I was in, well, every hill has got a number yeah. or a name. I was on Hill 347, and Port Shop, the outpost, was right, connected right to us, right to the front of us. Oh, wow. So on that hill is pretty much where you stayed the entire time, you were saying. Mm -hmm. And now where in relationship uh, was that in, in the country, uh, um, roughly? Had probably you... around 50, 60 miles north of Seoul. It, um, <laughs> when you're over there, you lose track of where... Oh, sure, I'll bet. East, west, or where yeah. you are in the country, yeah. really. But uh, now, at, at that point, now the war had been going on for a couple of years. At that point, had we pushed up to China and on our way back down, or where where did things stand? Uh, yes, that was all before I got there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was uh, strictly a replacement. Sort right. Of was, right. Okay. And, uh, they put me in uh, eighty-one mortars. Uh, <laughs> I was in what they call Howe Company, H Company, at, uh, which was heavy weapons. It uh, consists of 81 mortars, uh, 50 caliber machine guns, and your bazookas, or 75 regardless, whatever you want to call them. And those are the real big things that uh, we had in the 
They come up here real well. Is that what you trained on uh, in yeah, your training? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Was that were you given a choice there, or how did you end up in heavy? Uh... No, the uh, company commander just. Uh, I don't know if he went by uh, your papers or what. I have no idea, but uh, he just told me I was going to be in the eighty-one mortars, and uh, the other guy went in with me. He he went and regardless, I think it was, but. Uh, no, in fact, the the mortars, oh God, after about the first three, four days, um, at night, we were up there digging, and uh, they would put flares up, and they would light it up like you couldn't believe. Uh, and the first time it happened, it uh, sort of scares you, because you kept her hearing of Bonzi attacks and that. And uh, almost every night, uh, oh God, the bugles would blow, pots and pans clanging all over the place. It uh, scared the tire right out of you, truthfully. And that's what they were doing. It, uh, but I know the, about the second or third night, you finally get a little more used to it. All of a sudden it went dead silent, and then they started playing springtime in the Rockies. It, oh, <laughs> being from New York, it... it uh, didn't mean that much, but uh, it's something I'll never forget in my life, really. Mm. But uh, then after that, then they started, uh, well, it was in April. And they had a what big What was the charge. weather like uh, during, in that, during that period, April in particular? Uh, very similar to what this here, really. Oh, okay. uh, we didn't have too much rain. Um, they have monsoon rains, and that's usually... June and July in that area. It, uh, then you get soaked and muddy and everything else. It, uh, it's a mess. But um, no, the spring was, oh, you get some. But uh, I'd say quilt, probably around here, really. It, uh, but you had proper clothing and everything? Uh, well, <laughs> sometimes, yeah. <laughs> you, our eating, um, we lucked out because in the eight old mortars, of course, once you get them set up, why, uh, they had them zeroed in on all different areas out there, and, uh, oh, it, your, if the food, if they could get up through with their little jeep to you with hot food, they would do it once a day. If they couldn't, why, um, they must have all left us, oh God, it was about a five-gallon pail of, uh, strawberry jam, and the same thing of cheddar cheese and lots of crackers. So uh, I never had to eat the uh, little rations that uh, they give you in the service. That, uh, if we couldn't get the hot food, we were always nibbling on cheese or, <laughs> or the, the strawberry jam, really. Uh, it, uh, wow. It, yeah, it's uh, no, a lot of wool. Of course, they had to see rations and that they would eat, but... Uh, I would think after a time you kind of got tired of the same old cheese and starvy jam. Well, or? yeah, yeah, but you would only go up for maybe two or three days, and then they would sneak one of the only little... two or three days. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, okay. Well, it, uh, <laughs> it would go by fast at that point. It, uh, but uh, the mortars when I was in it, uh, you went from Ammo Bear to oh, right up to the Gunner very fast, really. Um, I was assistant gunner, and I was the one that dropped the, the shell into the tube. And uh, I don't know if you know mortar, but yeah, please explain the, to those that uh, that will watch this tape. What? Okay, it. Uh, but when you drop that tube down in, or the mortar down in, it hits a pin down there, and that's what sends it out. Yeah. Oh God, it was just going around the clock. It. Uh, we had a pile of wooden boxes. I bet it was 20 foot tall. And, it, and I don't know how many rounds were in one of the boxes. I think it was probably around six or nine, something like that. It, uh, but uh, we burnt the bottom of the one mortar out. They had to get a new one tube in there for us. And uh, But one of them I dropped in. And it was what you dread all the time. Nothing came out. Oh, jeez. And uh, you, you kick it, you hit it, you do everything 
course, you don't have too many things that you can hit it with. And uh, the ammo bearers at that point, they all uh, go to the bunkers and they get out of there. So it's left to the dunk gunner and the assistant gunner. And they, you disconnect it from the base plate. And now that's the gunner's job, and he lifts the tube up. And, uh, of course, the tube is hot. Now, this that's one bad thing. But I, being assistant gunner, you got to catch that round as it comes out. And as you, as it, it finally gets to you, you have sandbags about three feet behind you, about three foot high. And you would throw it over the, the blue once it got over there. Why, uh, you knew you were safe. <coughs> yeah. I finally got my hands on the thing. I threw it. But being nervous, I uh, didn't go too far. <coughs> the fin on the bottom of the, of the mortar hit the top sandbag. And instead of going down the hill, it went right down on the edge of the sandbag. We're laying on one side in the ground, and that thing blew on the other side. At the, None of us got hit, but we didn't have any sandbags afterwards. I know that. Uh -huh. And we lost our hearing. It, uh, I was going to ask you, I noticed your, your hearing aids, uh, you know, obviously <coughs> could be due to age, but I was wondering if it was war related. Yeah, it uh, oh, lost complete everything, it, uh, the two of us. And from that point on, geez, for about two weeks, they would have to have a messenger run back and forth on where to aim the gun and that. It, uh, because we couldn't hear anything on the phones, but uh, but then they well, finally leveled off, and uh, the Chinese finally gave up on it, and uh, went back to normal, fixing the trenches and stuff like that again. <coughs> and uh, oh, we went on patrols at night. Uh, I got caught on. Two or three of them. It, uh, they're scary. It, uh, yeah, what's that like? I mean, how uh, for someone like myself who's never been in combat, how does uh, how does a person prepare himself for that? You know, going out, knowing you're going out to that, and and uh, well, you, 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 we're going out on the oh, the far edge of uh, Port Chop, and uh, there's like a small little creek out in through there. No, that's no man's land, really. It, um, but you'd go out there and you were supposed to stay there until about, oh, we wouldn't leave until around probably 8.30. And uh, you stay out there until probably 1, one 2 o'clock and then make your way back. But the object was you were supposed to just stay out there and if you see or hear anything of the Chinese coming around, then you report back and uh, if it's a lot of them, you get back yourself, but uh, the scary part of it was um, there was usually 13, 13 to 15 guys on a on a patrol, and uh, I know the f one time I went and uh, we came back with two more guys than what we went out with, and. Uh, now, you know you got two Chinese in here, uh, but they wore the same clothing. A lot of your rock soldiers would wear, some would wear uh, uniforms. Now, when you say so rock soldiers, that's Republic of Korea. Your Republic Korea. of Korea, right. Okay. It, um, so you were, you were mingled with them as well? Well, we had uh, quite a few of them oh, okay. right in your company, yeah. That, uh, and some of the guys would wear the GI clothes, and other ones would wear... A lot of their, uh, same as what the North Koreans were wearing, really. And, but at that period of time, we were fighting the Chinese, really. It uh, wasn't uh, North Korea, really, I think. I, well, I imagine there still it was around, but uh, the Chinese more or less took over after they went up to the Yellow mm -hmm. River and came back. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, it... We got back in, and now we got two more than what we started with. Nobody knew who, but, uh, and they took off. We don't know where they went, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's sort of 
scare you when you do come back and you find out you, you, you got more than what you started with. Wow. You know? <laughs> but uh, that went on for, oh God, I don't know. They'd have skirmishes at night and stuff like that. Everything happened at night, really. Daytime, uh, if you could get any sleep, that's when you did it, really. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about living conditions. What were what were your sleeping conditions? You talked a little bit about food. Uh, were you guys sleeping in foxholes, or did you have... Uh... Well, we had bunkers, uh, but they were a wooden just pole frame, and then they had wire, combo wire going all over it, uh, to hold you up, it, uh, and a blanket on top, and that was it. it uh, so it wasn't uh, the most comfortable, really. A lot of guys just laid right outside, really. It. Uh, how do you, how do you think you function during this time? I mean, here you're you're out in the elements. You're not getting enough sleep. It doesn't sound like you're eating all that well. Uh, any one of those conditions by themselves would would do a person in. But on top of that, you got the umbrella and stress of war. All that's playing on you. How do you think uh, you, you you function and got through that? I don't know. It, uh, you're you're usually so tired. It uh, well, I know I fell asleep standing up holding against a shovel uh, one time. It uh, so I mean, <laughs> no matter where you lay down, why well, you you could go to sleep. There was no doubt of it. But right at that period of time. Uh, uh, when the fighting was going on, they had quite a latrine, and that thing took it dead yet, and blew it all to pieces. Well, now you're stuck with no latrine. So things had leveled off, and we weren't doing too much in the daytime, and I told one of the guys, I said, geez, let's get some ammo boxes, and we'll make our own little giant up. So that's what we did, and uh, dug the hole and everything, put the box on there, took the top and the bottom off, and uh, your mortars come into a cardboard tube uh, along in that box. So we took two of those tubes and slid them on the side and put them on the side of the box to sit against it. It looked like it was going to work pretty good. But one of the guys, he, <laughs> there was only about three or four of us that was in on it, he said, let's put some nails in these so I'll hook the wires to it. So we did. Then uh, he put the nails, three I think, on each side. It looked like it was holding the tube on. And uh, at night, he ran the top of the wire over to the CP. And now the, the radio has its own little generator, a field known radio. And if you crank that thing real hard, uh, you could generate 40 volts. I mean, it gives you quite a little jolt. Well, it, at the same time, we were getting a lot of replacements in, and one of them was the second lieutenant, and of all things, he was going to be ahead of the mortars. <coughs> Came over and he saw what we were doing, and uh, he says, I want to be the first to use it. Of course, otherwise, we're just digging holes in the... Uh, uh, but anyhow, we said, no, someone else already signed up, and he says, no, I'm going to pull rank on you. Well... We had set up, yeah, he could do it. Now, I was sitting on a little bit of a hill. <laughs> like I say, there was about three or four of us that was in on it. One guy was up in the CP, and when he saw him sit down, two of us nodded our head, and he cranked it for all he was worth. Oh, Jesus. That second lieutenant, he flew off in there, pants down around his ankles, <laughs> and we're all on for all our work, you know. <laughs> He got up from there and he looked at us and he says, I asked for it, I can see that. <laughs> said, he turned off, he was one of the nicest guys I think I ever met. Yeah. Really. It, uh, but uh, so some of the things you did that uh, <laughs> were mean, but it was funny yeah, at the time yeah. too, you know. And right after that, they called and they said, Merrick, down here, bottom of the hill, you got company. And I thought, oh, Jesus, they're going to get even with the digging that hole with the, the John, you know. And I didn't pay any attention to him. And uh, a few minutes later, a guy come up and he says, I'm not kidding you, you got company down here. And I still didn't believe him, but I went down to him. And uh, well, I ended up with St. Georgia. I went to school with him and, uh, yeah, graduated with him and everything else. Uh, How did he know you were there? His mother 
had uh, wrote him a letter telling him that I was over there in the 7th Division. And uh, he went through the Red Cross to find out what company. And, uh, well, he was in same uh, division. The only thing, he was in different battalion. And uh, so we got to see each other quite a bit from that time. Yeah, it uh, made it pretty nice. Yeah. That, uh, now, speaking of uh, letters and stuff, how was communications back home, uh, particularly from your folks or your wife? Uh... Uh, mail came through very good, really. Um, oh, I wrote my wife a letter every day. Hmm. Um, now, I wouldn't get mailed every day, uh, especially when you got busy. Sometimes you would have uh, two or three letters at a time where you could uh, send out. And usually the guy, when he'd bring up, if they could get there with a hot meal, he would pick up all the mail to take and send out for us. It, uh, and Sandy, she, I think she wrote every day when I was there. It, uh, mm -hmm. In fact, it got to the point where it would laugh, really, because uh, she'd put some kind of perfume on it. So they'd just, merit. <laughs> but... Uh, now, uh, I know during World War II, uh, a lot of the soldiers sending mail home was censored. Did you guys have to, were your, any of your mail censored at all? Or was it, uh, did it have to be read by a, an officer before it was sent out? Or was that rule I have discontinued? No idea, okay. Okay. Oh, it, so she didn't get any cut up letters or crossed out uh, sentences? She never when, said, okay. But, uh, okay. Yeah. No, she never said. I, I don't know. Of course, we were told not to tell where you're located right, and right, stuff like that, right. anyhow. But uh, and not moving around, I think that probably helped too. But, uh, but uh, then they came out. They said they wanted um, radio operators, and they would take three days in the company rear to train you. So I signed up for it. I figured, oh, geez. Get off the front lines for three days. Well, that was another question I was going to ask you too. Had had you gotten R and R pulled off the line at all during this time to go back? No, we stayed right there at the uh, in the front all the time. And uh, but I went back for uh, training on that, and actually the F O for the Howe Company, um, John Phillips was the name. I I I knew him. I'll never forget the name because I went through school with uh, John Phillips. It wasn't him, of course, but uh, the name just stuck in your head, you know. But uh, I was primarily a wireman, really, at the uh, String and Camel Wire. And, uh, and then in July, it went ahead again. And uh, at that time, I was just running wire net up on pork chop primarily, it, uh, back and forth. It, uh, and to go from Hill 347 to out on pork chop, um, let's see, you had Old Baldy to your left. In fact, there was two Old Baldies. I, I don't know if you realize that. One was held by the Chinese and one was held by the American U.S. And to the right of Hill 347 was Hill 200. And when you were going out to the port shop, the road would take you around 200, and that was more or less protected right in that area. And that was a jump-off point, really, uh, from there. And there was a river went down through there. Uh, God, I walked across it numerous times. But they had a bridge, but... PC characters were, were primarily the only thing that went across uh, up on there, really. They were the ones that take the supplies up and uh, bring the wounded and the dead back down, too. But, uh, <coughs> but I know the fighting started up real bad again. And, uh, oh, geez, our outfit was getting nailed like you couldn't believe. They'd send the company up and... Uh, Half would make it and half wouldn't. Uh, hmm. They told how many rounds landed. It's just hard to even imagine because you're uh, between the Americans and the artillery and the mortars, and then of course the Chinese had the same thing coming in on it. it uh, but the Chinese held half of uh, Port Shop, 
We still maintain uh, about half it, I guess. But I was going down because uh, wire would get hit with all these uh, artillery rounds and that. And it was faster just to string a new wire than it was uh, uh, trying to find where they'd cut it, really. But I got down to the river, then now this was monsoon season, and at first it had been raining, and then the sun would come out and it's hotter in blazes. It, uh, but I got to the river, and I knew you couldn't no way walk across it because the water was, oh God, it had been up to your neck at that point, where before it was below your knees. Mm. And uh, that's the last I remember. I, uh, next thing I know, I wake up, and uh, a soldier kicked my foot, and I was laying in a mud puddle, and he said, are you okay? And I says, yeah. But I looked and I had a bandage on my shoulder. You know, who put it there? I don't know. I, uh, and he says, where are you from? And I told him, 7th Division, 7th to 15th Regiment. He says, oh, God, you're in, I don't know, 22nd or 24th Division. I was in different one anyhow. How I got there, I don't know. I, uh, were you in a, in a hospital at that point? Uh, <coughs> uh, no. Just I, uh, I took the bandage off to see what had happened, and, oh, I got a mark on the shoulder, but uh, it wasn't bleeding that bad. It, uh, whatever it was, evidently hit me in the head, too, I guess, knocked me out, but... Uh, well, it took a mortar round and or a, a shell and some... Uh, you know, I, I really don't know. Is that I, right? I, huh. I, uh, in the medic, it put it there. I have no... I know I talked to us. The guy who was the medic in uh, our outfit, he said, no, it wasn't him. So uh, who it was, I don't know. I, uh, I never did meet him, so I don't know. That, uh, but they took me back to the company, and, oh, God, we were getting new guys in, gone. You didn't know half the guys in there, really. And uh, they had a company formation, and they said the uh, peace treaty had been signed. And... Uh, I don't know, he told the date, and uh, everyone was so tired, I just went back, they, they said, well, good, and went back to their cots, and then, uh, of course, you're in the company rear then, so you're in a tent, and uh, just fell asleep, and, but I got back there, and Ringo was one of the guys that was in the combo section, and I, uh, I asked him, I said, what date did he say it was? He says, 27th. He says, why? I said, Jesus, I turned 21 here. Week ago, and didn't even know it. <laughs> so, when I turned 21, I didn't celebrate. Let's put it that wow, way. Huh. It, uh, but then after that, why well, I, I figure we'd be shipped out to go home. But uh, no, they extended us, and uh, I was over there a little over about a year and a month, I guess, it, uh, something like that. It, uh, but then when I left, I left through Inchon, and. Uh, and we weren't too far from that area, so it uh, well, it was interesting, really. It, uh, now, with your your injury, did that cause you much pain, or did that heal up pretty good, or what was uh, what was the outcome of that? Well, when I got back, they um, for you. Well, I went back to Fort Dix, and uh, first of all, they gave you thirty days off. So it, uh, I. Uh, been a week really with my wife before my family even knew that I was home really, and uh, but then we all got together and uh, been, uh, enjoyed that whole month off really, but then I went back to Fort Dix and because uh, I still had six months to go in service, and you could sign up on what place you wanted to go. Well, I mentioned Fort Dix because I know I could drive back and forth to to our hometown and uh, on weekends anyhow but the first day of course it's it's a training center and so you were cadre is what you're going to be at the march and the guys around but the first morning was for Reverly and uh, putting the flag up and everything oh, I, there was a guy from company com uh, battalion out there with us and uh, after it was all over, why well, he came over and he said, do you remember me? I said, yeah, we was a company commander when I took basic. I didn't think he'd recognize me, really. 
He says, you ain't got much longer to go. And I said, no, six months. He said, do you like this job? And I said, no. But I said, I, I can make it back and forth to New York. He laughed and he says, uh, someone else to take your place tomorrow. He says, you have a new job. He said, no. you ever driven a Jeep? And I says, not legally. I said, I haven't got a license. That's what you mean. He says, uh, okay. Next morning, he uh, came over, gave me the paper license, and uh, all I did from that time on was he was a captain at this point, and uh, drive around with him. And uh, he was a cigar smoker, and you weren't allowed to drive the Jeep and smoke cigars. It, uh, that was one of the things. So either I was driving the Jeep and he was sitting there smoking or else uh, he'd drive and I was holding a cigar for him. <laughs> but that was the whole thing, really. It, uh, but uh, when I went to get out, why they asked you if there was any trouble. And I talked to her and my wife and my brother, really. And because uh, hearing, all the hearing came back in about two weeks after we lost it. But I know um, all your high pitches were gone. And uh, they, they at that time had a pocket watch and this is how they test your hearing. It, uh, well, I never did hear it, but when I know when they get it out here, well, you just shake your head no and that was all there was to it. And they said, are there any other trouble? And I said, no. And uh, so was, in a way it was good and in a way I could have been drawn a pension all my life for it, but um, yeah. But your uh, your shoulder hist uh, injury healed up with no problems? Oh, it was just, just, uh, just a mark here, it's all. It, uh, but the only thing I feel is if the weather's changing, then I'll feel it a little bit, but that's about all, really. It, uh, otherwise, no. But now the hearing in that, I uh, just this last year, I uh, tried to get the hearing aids through the VA, and <laughs> now you got to tell them when you lost it, um, how'd you lose it? They wanted the time, the dates, and everything. And so I went through the whole thing for this and the hearing. And uh, they said, well, they didn't look it up to see it. I had a, well, your heavy weapons uh, MOS when I went over there. And that's where I got into 81 mortars. But uh, they couldn't understand why a wireman would be uh, up on the front lines. I mean, they're usually behind a ways. And, uh, <clears throat> but they went along with the hearing end of it, and they give me, I don't know, a little over a hundred a month, I think it is, that, uh, that I get now. But they wouldn't do anything on the shoulder, no, because, uh, mm. mm. and I can't prove it. I mean, uh, and it was, uh, it was my own fault, really. At, uh, but at that time, you thought a lot of the government, truthfully. It, uh, it's not like it is now. It, uh, Seems like now everyone's out for everything you can get and the heck with the next guy, you know what I mean? Uh, and back then, I don't know if you could save the government a little bit, why, if it didn't bother you, why you did. And, mm. uh, well, hopefully you were awarded the Purple Heart for that. No. No. No, I, uh, no, I never, uh, I never even give it a thought, truthfully. It, uh, huh. Well, so many guys got lost and everything else that uh, they come straggling in afterwards. It, uh, if, where some of them have been, nobody knows. I mean, uh, it was strange, really, because uh, so they'd be on their way up to a pork shop, and oh, you'd have some that. Uh, get frayed when they start hitting into the bob wires to crawl underneath it. And then you get some that are gung-ho. Uh, 
Don't give a darn for anything, you know. It's, it's weird how people act, react, really. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But now, during this time, you said you you uh, had uh, Korean soldiers with you. Uh, did you ever interact with any of the other United Nations s soldiers there at all? Were you? We had Ethiopians um, with us. Yeah. Huh. Uh, now those guys, they were scary. Uh, they're tall. Uh, very slender guys. Uh, they didn't speak English at all. Uh, they had their own way of uh, alerting oh, for flares and stuff like that if they went out on patrol. In fact, I think the Chinese uh, were scared of those guys, really, because they were, they were good. There was no two ways out of it. it uh, they had no fear of darkness whatsoever. I mean... Uh, I don't know if they had electricity where they came from. I, I really don't know. But uh, hmm. they they were natural fighters, really. They were, they were good. It, uh, but, yeah, we had those guys with us. Um, well, you you didn't go with them all the time. They were more or less in their own, own group. Um, a lot of the guys I was with... Um, there was quite a group of, of Mormons. Um, hmm. I, uh, I bet we had twenty, at least twenty in the in the company. Hmm. It was Mormon. It, uh, in fact, the comp the sergeant that was ahead of uh, the Camel section. He was in prison and uh, went over by shotgun under shotgun. Uh, it's, that was how he got out of uh, prison, really, was huh. uh, going over to Korea, going up on the front lines, and uh, uh, he was a nice guy, really. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, when he tells you that, then it really makes you wonder, why was he there to begin with, you yeah, know? Yeah. It, uh, he never said that. Uh, huh. Did you have any interaction with uh, the local Korean civilians at all? No, no. I never did. Yeah, no, okay. It, yeah. uh, it's oh some of the guys they kept you separated most of the time. Yeah. Um, there wasn't too many um, Koreans really around the areas we were. You would have to go back primarily to Seoul, in that area. Um, oh, they had one spot where after the war was over. Why? Uh, yeah, I think they had a fence down through there because. Uh, all of a sudden, some of the guys were getting caught with a different kind of venereal disease. And uh, first, they made a little specter of the guys. They'd make them sleep in a little pup tent all by himself. And, uh, but then, all of a sudden, some of the lieutenants got caught. And well, then the pup tents went, and everything came back to normal again. But... Um, so it was happening to quite a few of them. It was, um, it ran around with that, that group anyhow. Yeah. To, but no, I never had. Yeah. It, um, now, when you uh, shipped back to the States, did you come back via ship again, or did you fly home, or how'd you get, uh, how'd no, you get home? No, we came back by ship. Uh, when we left um, Seoul, what, they took us by Jeep from our company to um, Seoul. From there, they put you on a big, um, Oh, we called them uh, just big trucks, open tractor trailers, really. And they ran us over to Incheon, and uh, but uh, oh, your tide was out at that point, so our ship was way out there. So they put us on um, LSCs, I think they call them. It's the one where landing craft where mm -hmm. the front opens up, and uh, they would take us by uh, shore out to the big boat uh, by well, one of those things really and it was funny all the the guys that I went through basic with over half of them were all right together going back on the ship is that right yeah uh. it uh, we uh, bunked right next to each other just like it was when we came over really it, uh, only it was a year or some odd lately yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, one thing I had to laugh was 
they gave you, you know, we call them a horse pill. I think they were for, I don't know, it was hemorrhagic. Some kind of a fever you could possibly get. Um, but you had to take them uh, before you got your meal, and they wouldn't give you no water. It, uh, so, so you knew ahead of time, boy, you, you collected all the slime you could in your mouth. Because you had to swallow that thing or they wouldn't let you in to, to get your meal. And, uh, but they were, they were great big devils. And, uh, oh, some of the guys, they would choke and everything else, get those things down, huh. you know. But, uh, no, after the first time, boy, you learned to collect all the slimy you could so you could swallow that thing and have it done with it. Uh, but, uh, in all the... The, if there was any officers in the, the group, there's quite a few heading home. Um, they were the ones that served all the meals, it, uh, it's, which was just reverse of what yeah. it normally is, you know. It, uh, but then when we got to Fort Lewis again, that uh, was all set up right out in an open field, really. Uh, you had people, local people, running all over the place with signs for their, because they knew maybe their son or something like that or their husband or whatever uh, could be on that ship, you know. And, uh, yeah, here we are running around with just underwear on, and that was it, going from one tent to another to get clothes and everything to get home, really. But then they said, anyone at least lived east of the Mississippi, they would fly you. And anyone west of the Mississippi, why they went by train. And uh, so that's how I flew. And uh, in fact, we stopped at Cheyenne up here. Huh. And uh, was it Warren Air Force uh -huh. Base? I, and that's where we had supper and that. And uh, in fact, I know at the time I said, Jesus, well, I'd never live in a place like this because the wind was so strong. You you had to lean about a 45 degrees to keep it go, walking, you know. Never did I ever think I'd be living out in this area. Right, and, uh, right. Yeah. But, uh, so I bet the homecoming was nice when you got back. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, our last day at uh, in service, all of us had drove down to Fort Dix and... Uh, now we had about seven cars heading to Rochester at the same time. And uh, we all said there was no drinking going on until we got to Rochester. We'd all have a beer together and then say goodbye. Uh, that went for about ten minutes. I think the first town outside of uh, Fort Dix, uh, well, Camden, New Jersey, they found a beer joint the first thing in the... All of a sudden, the cars pulled over. <laughs> I think we hit every town all the way back. <laughs> then we got to Rochester. And of course, you're, at that time, you always had to wear your uniform. You uh, you couldn't wear the civilian clothes. And uh, you walk into a beer joint, and my like, God, uh, you'd have so many beers sitting in front of you uh. from the locals. That, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty neat. But I know... If, I had to drive oh, about 30 miles west and uh, to get home. <laughs> Ridge Road is what took me right straight out there, and it's a four-lane highway. And I swear that was an eight-wide. Uh, I put her in what I figured was the center, <laughs> motor straight out. <laughs> Got home, and I told Sandy, I said, well, I made it. <laughs> her father was there. He, he was in the CV, so he... He, he knew uh, what a GIs went through. Oh, he started haw haw for all he was worth. <laughs> I think it was the first time in my life I ever got drunk. But uh, <laughs> I had made it anyhow with no problems. <laughs> now, uh, I guess a reverse question to an earlier question. How was it uh, the transformation going from military life after everything you'd been through back to civilian life. Was that much of a transition? And along those lines, I mean, now, today we know about the post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome and such. Do you think you felt, had any of that? Or how was, you, how was that transition for you? Uh, we got an apartment, the first thing. 
and uh, I had nightmares oh for probably uh, six months. Not every night, but uh, probably two or three out of the week. At uh, but Sandy would uh, wake me up and she say, "You having a nightmare again?" I said, "Yeah," and uh, a lot of times I get up. Maybe have a cup of hot tea or something like that, and then I'd go back to sleep and I'd be okay. It, uh, but that was the only way it affected me, really. Yeah. It, uh, did Did Sandy ever say anything or, or uh, notice a changed man from the the, the man that w went off to war? I oh, mean, I lost weight. I know that. But it, yeah. <laughs> I went in at two hundred and came back at about one hundred sixty. I think it was at. Uh, yeah, they uh, they walk it off. You're pretty good shape, it, uh, but we started getting. We wanted to build a house in Brockport, and so all the time I was over there, I was sending my paycheck because you just got the script over there, and oh, I kept I think about five dollars a month just for buying film and stuff like that, really, and. Uh, she had been saving because she was working at Kodak, and uh, so we had enough money to put down on a lot, and then uh, started going around seeing where we get money to uh, build a house on it, really. <coughs> and uh, that took us, oh God, the best part of a year, really. But uh, finally got money on that and built the house. And, Oh God, let's see. Ron was born right. Uh, well, I got out in fifty four, nineteen fifty four, and Ron was born in nineteen fifty six. And uh, we were in the apartment still at that point, but he was about six months old, I think, when we moved into the new house. And then of course Sue came right after that, and. Uh, but, uh, and then of course one day after that, of course, but uh, in the meantime, her father, he passed away. God, he was only 50. At the, he had smothering and pneumonia, I guess they called it. Mm -hmm. and went to sleep at night and never woke up in the morning. That was mm -hmm. all there was to it. But, uh, but that was right when Sandy was carrying Wendy, and uh, they wouldn't let her go to the funeral or anything like that. She had to had trouble carrying her, really. And, uh, but, uh, I don't know, after that we sold the house and bought a farm, 10 acre farm. And uh, that <laughs> had a crick went on it full time, um, right on the back of it. At, uh, it was about know, 20 foot wide, something like that. It, uh, so we got into, had a horse, quite a few ponies. Oh, Jesus. Old McDonald's farm is what I used to call it. But, uh, but uh, that's where the kids all grew up, really. Mm. It, uh, it was a good place for them, really. It, uh, and the neighbors right there were, uh, the guy who lived next to us, so he was big grove of pine trees in between us. I don't know, there's a thousand feet in between, but... Uh, Bob and I uh, went to school together and graduated together. At, uh, his kids were about the same age as ours, and they were up the street. They were the same way. At, uh, so the kids uh, all were about the same age, really. At, uh, so I made a nice place for them to grow up. At, uh, but uh, I got a job. I had gone back to the tattoo and die, and I worked at for a while. They were trying to get the union in there, and uh, the guy who owned the place, uh, he told us, he said, if the union gets in, I'm going to close doors. And, uh, well, they tried, jeez. I, I bet three or four times I got voted in on it. And uh, finally I got a chance to go to Kodak, and uh, so I quit, went to Kodak, and got out of it. And right after that, they did vote the union in, and he did close doors. Mm -hmm. uh, where the guys all went, because they employed around 1,500, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
where they all went, I have no idea. I, I think some probably transferred to Kodak, but, uh, but uh, so I take it then, uh, Kodak is what brought you here to Colorado. You came out yeah, with the, the I, new plant. Uh, they they put a sign at uh, oh I'd worked there quite a few years. They put a sign up and uh, want to know if they had bought property out here and want to know if anyone was interested in uh, transferring out with the uh, coding department. Uh, I run up and put my name on the list. I was second on the list and uh, oh, they had so many on the list. They finally took it down. And they said no, they weren't going to take it. it uh, so, but the guy that was the head of the coding out here, I worked with back there. And, uh, in fact, we relieved each other uh, almost every week. And uh, I found out it was Gus Trinnell who was the head one out here. And I called Gus, and uh, I said, got room for me? He says, oh, God, yeah. He says, come on out. So uh, that's how I got out here. Really. And we came out and... 1975, and I didn't think, my son Ron, I didn't think he would come, really. Uh, he was out of high school. He had a job at, Code, or at uh, GE, and uh, he was in the plastics at GE. I figured, well, I know he liked the job, and all of a sudden he showed up one night, and uh, he says, you think you can get me in over there? I said, I don't know, Ron, because you were talking then around Thanksgiving time, and usually, they didn't hire usually at that point. If they did, why, well, it would be after the first year when they would start. But uh, they put him in the, the plastics, hired him the first thing. Uh, God, he, he ended up with uh, three days off at Thanksgiving with pay, three days off with... Uh, Christmas time will pay, and then New Year's, he says, God, this is the best job I ever had in my life. <laughs> he thought that was great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he uh, married a girl out here. That, uh, they got, had three children. That, uh, they got the two boys and the, and the girl. Uh, the girl, in fact, she is... Uh, Tiana's going to graduate from high school uh, this summer, or another month, uh, really. And uh, the boys are, oh God, one's around 30, the other one's 32, or something like that. They got family, or the one of them does. He's got two grandchildren, or two kids, that, uh, two great grandchildren for me. Right, and, yeah. And then Sue, she married a guy from. It, uh, she went around with back east, and they got married out here, and they moved back for about oh, two, three years, I guess. She missed her mother, and uh, she talked Neil into moving out, and uh, so they've been out here ever since. And they got three children. Uh, each one of them had three children, really. Had so you've got nine grandchildren? Uh, nine grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. <laughs> so, it, uh, yeah, Sue is, uh, she's got two girls and a boy, and uh, Wendy, she's got uh, two girls and a boy. The boy's the youngest. He's still in, uh, let's see, AJ is, I'm trying to think what grade he's in. He's in an elementary school in Eagle. At, uh, but uh, he's in the racing. Um, he races, uh, God, I can't think what kind of cars they are. The one's got a big wing on the top. And uh, this thing does over 100 miles an hour. I mean, uh, and he's been racing since he was five years old. Uh, he's scary. He has no nerves in his body, I don't think. It, uh, but he races against guys that are um, high 20s, a couple of them are in their 50s, at, uh, and he's beating them. That's the best part of it. <laughs> 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 but, uh, 
but they got nerve and uh, <laughs> they all tend to slow down on the ends and uh, their oval cracks. And, but he pushed it uh, around that track, you know, average high 70s uh, going around it. it uh, now they've got a great big um, car up there now. And I don't know if he's going to race that this year. I think he is. It, uh, that came out of NASA at uh, Vegas, I think it was, that wow. raced last year. Wow. Uh, I don't know. That's going to be a little scary. It, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I take it you went on and had a full career at, at Kodak and retired from Kodak then? Yeah, I uh, I retired a they came out with an early retirement in 1986, and uh, I took it. I was only, well, 53 at the time, but uh, had a wood shop for a while, and God, that got going too good, big. It, uh, I figured, geez, I'm putting 10 hours a day in the wood shop, and uh, I'd done better off staying at Kodak if I was going to do that. So I let that go, and... Uh, Oh, I still got all the things that I could make, but uh, I don't do too much anymore. Yeah. But uh, I went as an aide on a special ed bus for the school system. And I rode on the bus for, well, Sandy was a bus driver. And uh, she wanted me to be a dr driver. And I said, oh, Jesus, I hear too many war stories and uh, what you go through. I, uh, I... I just ate as the aid and let the other guy worry about it. But uh, I did that for, I guess, eight years. And uh, then I got out of it for a while. And I don't know. I like working with the kids, really. Yeah. And uh, so I went back as a uh, crossing guard for school. And I've done that for the last six, seven years, I guess. And, uh, yeah, that's nice. It, uh, I still get daytime off and everything. And... Uh, but I get to see the kids every morning and at night. At the, yeah. So that's what I do now, really. And then with Sandy's ordeal, why, uh, it uh, keeps your mind off it a little bit. It uh, helps. It. Yeah. <coughs> well, Don, we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything I didn't ask you uh, that you wanted to talk about? Or as we've been sitting here, any stories float up that you wanted to talk about? So hopefully that we've We've rounded out your story as best we can, or do you think we, we pretty much covered it all? I think you covered just about all yeah. of it, really. Okay. But, uh, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Loveland that much, but uh, Bill Reed used to have wooden bleachers out back mm -hmm. there. Okay, I'm the one that got the contract to take them down, and... Uh, Took the wood up. We had built a bought property up at uh, Storm Mountain and uh, Cedar Springs. There was a small lake up there. I was right on the edge of that. And uh, we built a house up there. At, uh, we lived up there for, I don't know, three, four years. But there was no electric. I was doing everything with generator. And uh, I'm not a mechanic. And uh, I was spending, I think, as much money on generators. Well, one a year is what I was going through. It, uh, but uh, then I bought the house down on 4th Street and uh, I don't know, I run the place out up there but uh, I ran in all kinds of trouble with that and uh, so I finally, after he got out, I put it up for sale and uh, sold it and I think it's been bought about three times since then, it didn't really. It didn't. But I stopped up uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, the guy who was, owned it was right there. And uh, when I walked down in, I was talking to him, and he says, you're the one that built this? And I says, yeah. It, it was real heavy. It, um, the subflooring on that thing um, were 2 by 12 laying flat. I to give you an idea. I had three beams underneath it, and I had uh, beams for the loft area uh, every two feet. Well, there were three beams in that uh, 
oh, uh, the bleachers, and they were 230 feet long, and uh, they were 10 by 10s. At, uh, now, you got three of them that size. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of... Uh, uh, I had to cut them down, but you got to watch on where you're cutting them so you can reuse them. I mean, you know, that... Uh, but it worked out good, really. It, uh, <coughs> but then on top of the subflooring, I put plywood to smooth everything right off. And uh, oh, the guy up there, as soon as he saw that deck, he he had a big, uh, oh, about ten, twelve foot blade, on a big bulldozer. He said, "You're gonna come up here one of these nights and see that dozer sitting right on your deck." And I said, "Oh God, don't do that for heaven's sake." You may end up in the basement, you know. He says, oh, they'll hold it, I know. And I says, oh, trust me, just forget about it. Don't bother. Yeah. Huh. Uh. Well, one last question I always like to ask with these interviews. How do you think that time period you spent in the Army, in particular in Korea, on, on, the, on the front lines, did that play a role in your life, affect your life, change your life at all? Or, or do you just kind of see this just a chapter in your life that you went through? How do you think you would answer that? Well, I think it was more or less just a chapter in the life that uh, you were going through. It, um, had we have had an apartment and was living in it and then get drafted, um, it would have been a lot harder for Sandy for one thing. Because uh, she'd be left alone at that point, uh, versus at least she was still living right there at home with her mother and father. Yeah. And, uh, so that uh, made it much easier for her. Did, and, did she ever talk when you guys got back? Did she ever talk about her feelings while you were gone and, and knowing that you're in, in uh, harm's way? And Oh, yeah. It, uh, in fact, when I went on R&R, &R, um, it's was three days in Japan at, uh, at Tokyo, really. But I went with um, Baraka, I think his name was. He lived in California. He was Japanese uh, ancestry, and he could speak fluent Japanese as well as he could American, really. And uh, so when we went on R&R, &R, the two of us went together. Well, boy, that made it nice, because... Uh, he, he could talk their language, and you knew you weren't going to get uh, hooked on prices or anything else. That, uh, but to call home, we stayed in a special service hotel, and uh, you would have to put your name on the list, and give them the number and everything. And uh, then when the time came, they would have a guy walking around with, uh, with signs, because none of the guys... Uh, it worked there. None of them spoke English, I don't think. Everything was done with the signs. They would write your name and uh, the telephone number and that. Look you up. But uh, it's not like a cell phone. Um, you're, oh God, you were screaming in the, the phone to hear it. And uh, at the same time, Sandy had a, a Cocker Spaniel dog. And they had just gotten hit by a car and killed that day. And that was the day I picked a, to call that night. But, uh, yeah, it was good talking to her, really, even though it, you had to howl like crazy to even hear anything back and forth. That, uh, but it's hard to believe how the cell phones are now compared right, to yeah. that. In fact, speak for that. Right. This thing will be ringing any minute. Okay, well, well, we'll wind down this interview then. I guess uh, I have one question I forgot. Always, I always ask, I forgot to ask. Through the years, did you ever keep in touch with any of your buddies you served with? Or was there any sort of reunions or anything like that? No, we went around with two or three of them uh, in Rochester. But um, uh, I don't know. After we moved out here, lost contact yeah, with them really. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, most of the guys I've worked with back east, uh, they're all passed away now. Yeah, it uh, yeah. surprised me. It, yeah. uh, hard to believe, but uh, times do change, there's yeah. no doubt. Yeah. It, uh, 
So no, I haven't uh, been in contact with him. That's, uh, I don't know if Dick Pink was uh, the one guy, and I don't know if he's still around or not. That uh, mm. I wouldn't dare say. Yeah. Well, Don, I want to thank you for sitting down to, to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Oh, I thank you. That, uh, Okay, the top one is the ship that I came back on. And this was right at Seattle, where we uh, pulled in on, really. Jeez, how many people were on the ship? Uh, probably around 3,000. Three, is that right? 3,500, yeah. something like that, yeah. And I noticed you got uh, you, you found yourself on the... Yeah, well, I knew I was right next to one of the columns. And, uh, but uh, the picture on the bottom is... Uh, when you first went in service, really. Okay, hold on a second. I'll get down to that one. This was your basic training group? Uh, yeah. This is the group that I uh, went in with from uh, out of Rochester area, really. It, uh, Let's see if I can get this without uh, any glare. And where are you in the picture? Uh, right there. It had been raining in <laughs> Massachusetts at that time, as you can see. We all had the yeah. rain gear on. That's Hank Dilger and myself. Hank is the one that uh, came up and saw me during the war, at, uh, right after I got over there, really. At, uh, hmm. That's the switchboard. At, uh, we had, to, after the war, you maintained it with... Uh, it was in the commo section, and uh, one of us had to stay awake all night long. It, uh, I didn't think of it. <laughs> we usually put the lightest sleeper of the group right next to it. <laughs> but, uh, this is how you wash your clothes. That's all there was to it. Just boil them in with the heater. It, uh, in the heater in the winter time. Uh, we had to turn them off at uh, 8 o'clock at night, so you didn't have any heat in the tents, uh, even in the wintertime, uh, just in the daytime, that was all. This is the commo section, and uh, the guy in the center is Maroka, the Japanese, he's the one I went on r, &R with. It, uh, he, in fact, his grandparents lived in Tokyo, and he never looked them up. That sort of surprised me, really. It, uh, this has a, a round cylinder that fits in there. I don't know how many shells it holds, but it's so big. And it would just go burp, and it'd run the whole works out, and nothing's went. It, uh, and that's that's why they called it a burp gun, I yeah, think. Okay. It, it's just what it sounded like, really. These are bunkers, that, and that one was on pork chop. It uh, was all made up uh, after the war, it, uh, for a while anyhow. It, uh, how it is now, I don't know. It's in no man's land now, so it may not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. it, this is the same bunker, only it's just a close-up, a different view of it. So it uh, and these were the bunkers you guys would stay in, or these lookout bunkers, or what? Uh... These are, well, there's a combination of both, really. Okay. It, uh, use them for lookout in. Stay in it. Uh, this was after the war, just reclaiming some of the camo wire. It, uh, we pulled back everything we could on it, really, and we'll take it down. This is the 81 mortar group. It, uh, it, uh, that's the 81 mortar that they were just cleaning it up and uh, doing practice runs on it. it uh, this is the rank I was as a corporal. This is uh, the 7th Division patch that you wore over in Korea. These are just, uh, this came from Korea. This is CIV, Combat Infantry Badge. These here are just ribbons of the areas you were in, really. Now, I noticed two uh, cluster stars here. Uh, did they signify battles, or what were the... Uh... Um, I take it that's what they were, but I'm not sure. Okay. It, uh, but even in the old uh, paper you get, um, 
mentions those two uh, two stars. So I take it that and that's what I was in was two two big battles, and that was it. Okay. Very good. It was taken just before I got out of service, really, and, and I. I'm not sure, really. I think probably Fort Dix, I would imagine. Yeah. It, uh, All it's right. a picture I didn't take, let's put it that way. Yeah, it, right. Uh, no, maybe they did. Someone did, I am. Uh, Very good. Thank you.